When massive stars are at the end of their lives, they collapse and explode. When they do so, they release more energy into the space than the Sun in its entire lifetime, and sometimes they can even outshine their galaxy. But scientists are still confused why the stars even explode. So what can make such a massive amount of matter explode, and how much do we really know? All stars are born from clouds of gas that are spread out in galaxies. Most of the matter in them is composed of hydrogen, which was formed during the Big Bang. These gas clouds are not as static as they may seem. Instead, they are slowly collapsing due to gravitational pull. As they shrink in size, they are getting hotter. When a gas cloud is dense enough, it will reach 15 million degrees Celsius, a critical temperature which kicks off nuclear fusion. In this process, Two or more atoms are moving at such a high speed that they will overcome the repulsive force between protons, and so they will be able to fuse into one heavier atom. When the nuclear fusion starts, the gas cloud officially becomes a star. Fusion is critical for the life of stars, because it releases energy inside them. This is the same energy that makes stars so bright for billions and trillions of years. But it also has another purpose. As the energy is trying to escape from the middle of the star to the surface, it kind of pushes against gravity, and so it's preventing the star from gravitational collapse. Once stars are born, their lives can be quite different, depending on how heavy they are. Very light stars, with mass less than half that of the Sun, are called red dwarfs. They will barely reach the critical temperature for nuclear fusion, which means that it will be inefficient and slow. Because of that, red dwarfs are not very bright, but they will fuse their hydrogen supply so slowly that they will outlive all other stars. They can live up to 10 trillion years, which is almost 1000 times longer than the current age of the universe. For stars such as the Sun, fusion reactions will be more efficient, and so they will fuse all of their hydrogen supply into helium in only 10 billion years. When all hydrogen is fused into helium, fusion reactions stop, which means that the gravity will start compressing the star again, making it even hotter. The temperature will rise to the point where it kicks off the second fusion cycle. This time, helium atoms will fuse into heavier elements, like carbon. This was not possible before, because helium atoms have not one, but two protons, so they need to be moving even faster to overcome the repulsive force between them. When helium starts fusing into carbon, the Sun's outer layer will expand enormously in size, and will consume inner planets of the solar system, including the Earth. This will happen to the Sun in about 5 billion years, and it won't be just the end of the Earth, but also the end of the Sun as we know it. That's because when helium is used up, the nuclear fusion will come to a complete stop. After that, the Sun won't be hot enough to continue nuclear fusion of heavier elements, and gravitational pull not strong enough to cause gravitational collapse. The outer layer of the Sun will eventually escape the star, forming a nebula. The Sun will then become a white dwarf. It will get compressed to roughly the size of Earth, and it will slowly cool down, becoming less and less bright. But more massive stars, that are at least 8 times heavier than the Sun, are capable of producing supernova. These stars will undergo a similar process as the Sun, but in a much shorter time. It only takes them a couple million years. Once all of the helium is fused into carbon, the process repeats again. So after fusion of helium, a few more fusion cycles will follow. Fusion of carbon, oxygen and silicon. Each fusion cycle lasts a much shorter time. For example, the last cycle, where silicon is fused into iron, will only last around a single day. But as the fusion of silicon into iron is complete, nuclear fusion will come to an end. This is because iron is the most stable element, and must actually absorb energy in order to fuse into heavier elements. So after iron core is formed, there isn't any energy from nuclear fusion that could support the star against its gravity. And in the next single second, the iron core will suddenly collapse in on itself. During this one second, the star will undergo a massive change. The matter in the middle of the star will collapse into a much smaller space, at a speed of about 70,000 km per second, which is almost a quarter of the speed of light. But after that one second, something will suddenly stop the collapse. So what can stop such an immense force? Well, 
and even more immense force. As the core is collapsing, the individual atoms will get extremely close to each other. In a classical matter, like the chair you are currently sitting on, the nuclei of atoms are spread out quite a lot. For comparison, if atomic nuclei were the size of humans, they would be about 10 kilometers away from each other. But during the collapse, they will get so close that they will basically start touching. They are not very social, so this is their absolute boundary. However, the extreme force of gravity will try to push them beyond this boundary, and at that moment, strong nuclear force will suddenly come into play. It will slow down the collapse and ultimately cause a rebound. This rebound creates a huge shockwave, which will travel from the collapsed core all the way to the surface of the star, hitting up everything in its way. Once it reaches the surface, it will blow it up into outer space, and it will make it so hot that the exploded star will become 50 million times brighter than before. This is when we can observe the supernova, and it will last for several months. While all of this may sound somewhat logical, it's not exactly clear why the star explodes. Scientists are quite sure about the part where the core of the star collapses. Once there is no nuclear fusion and there is just too much matter, nothing will stop the gravitational collapse. Depending on how heavy the star is, it will either become a neutron star or a black hole. But calculations have shown that the shockwave created during the collapse should not be strong enough to cause such a massive explosion. So something else must help in the process of ripping the star apart. But what is it? Scientists first suspected that neutrinos might be the key to the answer. Neutrinos are fundamental particles, but they are a bit weird. They only interact with other particles via weak nuclear force, which is, well, quite weak. For example, around 100 trillion neutrinos pass through your body every second, yet only one neutrino will interact with your body every few years. Science predicted that the collapse of the core should create a huge amount of neutrinos, for one simple reason. The collapse brings the matter to such extreme conditions at which atoms are not stable anymore. Instead, protons and electrons are forced to combine into neutrons, and in this process, neutrinos are released. It is believed that neutrinos actually steal about 99% of all energy released during supernova. Because of their very weak interaction, most of them just escape the star, completely ignoring all the matter around. But scientists suspected that they might release some of their energy back into the shockwave. If enough energy was transferred back, the shockwave could reach the surface and rip the star apart. To find out if this could actually work, astronomers turned to computer simulations. But whenever they tried to model neutrinos in a collapsing star, the shockwave would eventually stop. Over the past few decades, many more effects besides neutrino interactions have been added to the simulations, with some of the simulations resulting in supernovae. But as the models are getting more and more complex, it's hard to identify a single reason why the stars explode. Instead, it seems that only a mixture of many different effects combined together can cause a supernova. However, there is another approach to studying supernova explosions. Instead of computer simulations, we can simply detect light and particles coming from real supernovae. This could help immensely in understanding them, but the problem is that they are quite rare. In a galaxy like ours, there is only one supernova every 50 years. The most recent supernova occurred in 1987, in a small galaxy right next to the Milky Way. It was the first close supernova that was studied by modern astronomers, and for the first time they were able to detect incoming blasts of neutrinos. But since then, no new supernova has occurred so close to us. Astronomers have started looking beyond our galaxy, revealing about 10,000 supernovae every year. But these distant supernovae provide less information, because the only thing we can detect from such a far distance is light, and there is only limited information that we can deduce from that. Therefore, astronomers are waiting for a new supernova in our galaxy, which could happen any day now. And this time, we could detect not only neutrinos, but also gravitational waves, which was not possible in 1987. If we detected gravitational waves created by a collapsing star, we could maybe put all the pieces finally together. But for now, we cannot do much more other than just wait for it.